Coming up on today's episode of Locked On Sooners, who benefits the most from Jeff Levy's offense? Got some basketball notes to dig into as well. All that and more on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, Sooners Nation? Welcome to the Locked On Sooners podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Sonos. Experience the game like never before with the Sonos Arc, the premium smart soundbar for TV, movies, music, gaming, and more. Visit Sonos.com to learn more. Thank you for joining me. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. You can read my work covering the Oklahoma Sooners over at the Sooners Wire at usatoday.com. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Locked On Sooners and on Facebook, Locked On Sooners Podcast. And we're going to get into some offensive football, talking about Jeff Levy's offense and who benefits the most. Did a little digging, looking back at Jeff Levy's offense with Southeastern when he was with the NAIA Fire. Also, his time at UCF and um, at Ole Miss. And a few things that I kind of discovered here. So, Jeff Levy's offenses have never finished outside the top 10 in total offense. So, that's yards per game. So, with Southeastern, he was number three in the NAIA in total offense. Uh, His first year at UCF, they finished number five in the nation with 530.9 yards per game. 530.9 yards per game. Um, his second year at UCF in 2018 with 523.5 yards per game, number four in the nation. Um, the following year in 2019, number two in the nation in total offense. His first year at Ole Miss in 2020, they were number three in the nation in total offense at 555.9 yards per game. And that's going up against a lot of SEC defenses in that 2020 season. If you'll remember correctly, they didn't play many non-conference games. So that's pretty salty um, offensive output for Jeff Levy's offense. And then in 2021, they were number sixth in the nation in total offense at 492.4 yards per game. His scoring teams have been really good as well. Uh, and when he was with the NAIA Southeastern Fire, they finished number one in scoring offense. His first season at UCF, number one in scoring offense at 48.2 points per game in 2017, and number six in scoring offense in 2018. And then in 2019, they were number five in scoring offense. Things got a little bit more difficult when he got to the SEC, as you'd imagine. And he finished number 14 in 2020. And in 2021, they were number 24 in scoring offense. So the thing that is the most significant takeaway for me when I'm looking back at Jeff Levy's offenses uh, through his tenure as an offensive coordinator. One, this is going to be an overstatement, but they're really good or an understatement. They're really, really good. Uh, Secondly, they run a ton of plays. Um, There was not a year in which he's been an offensive coordinator that they ran fewer than 70 plays per game. And generally they ranked uh, well within the top 10 um, in plays ran per game. So in in 2021 with Ole Miss, they ran 78.2 plays per game. That was number two in the country. Um, In 2020, they were number three in the country, 79.7 plays per game. In 2019, they were number four, 78.1. The only time that he finished outside the top 10 um, in plays ran per game were his first two years at UCF but they still ran more than 70 plays per game. He's going to run a lot of plays. He's not afraid to have his offenses drive the football, which for all the, you know, the positive things at times that Lincoln Riley did for the Oklahoma Sooners and the things that did go well uh, for that offense, this, these last couple of years, they lived and they died with the big play. They were so reliant on the deep passing game or on Kennedy Brooks run, you know, or Ramon J. Stevenson in 2020 breaking a 15, 20 yard play that, you know, they didn't have to try to drive the ball when teams forced them to drive the football, when they weren't running the ball as efficiently, when they weren't gashing teams and getting big plays on the ground, they weren't hitting Marvin Mims deep. It was a struggle for this team. Aside from the Kansas state game, that was the only time this season where I felt like the other team was going to force them to drive the football or drive the length of the field to try to score and the Oklahoma Sooners were more than willing to do so, and it worked. 
you know, in that game, they, they scored on every single one of their drives, except for the final one uh, of the game where they were able to kneel on it. That is something that should have, they should have been more willing to do, be more patient offensively. And, you know, just take what the defense is going to give you. If they're not going to let you throw the ball downfield, quit trying to force it into double, triple coverage and just take five, six yards at a time. You know, you look at a Jeff Levy offense. Yeah, they never really led the country in yards per play, unlike a Lincoln Riley offense that was always up at the top in yards per play. But they were putting out great offensive outputs in yardage, scoring a ton of points, running a ton of plays, and also getting a lot of first downs. You look back at Jeff Levy's, you know, offenses as well. In addition to running a lot of plays, they were also in the top 10 every single year in first downs per game as well. Um, and, and I think that's indicative to me of a, of a coach that understands like, Hey, I don't have to score on every play. It, obviously it's great if I'm able to do that, but if I pick up first downs, that's going to give me a better chance at scoring. So many times this past season in, in particular, they would have a bad play on first down. They'd really just go for it on second down, try and hit something down the field. And then on third down, they're sitting at third and long and, and they still can't get anything going. There just was never enough of the underneath the short passing game consistently this season that was going to allow the Oklahoma Sooners to be efficient offensively. Uh, you know, they had great games. They had some great offensive outputs, but when there wasn't the deep ball available to them and they didn't have receivers making incredible plays like Marvin Mims in the Texas game, uh, you got Mario Williams coming up big in the Texas Tech game. If they didn't get that from their wide receivers, they were struggling to move the football down the field. And we saw that in the second half of the Oklahoma State game. You know, the, the Sooners were looking for the big play. They weren't getting anything downfield and they couldn't do anything underneath and they couldn't move the football. And so you look at a Jeff Levy offense that's coming in and getting run by Dylan Gabriel, and this is going to be an efficient team, efficient offense that runs a ton of plays. And while they've had really, really explosive offenses as far as yardage is concerned, they're very well balanced too. Like they run more run plays than pass plays every single year, except the first year that he was at UCF and they well, no, they still ran from they had they still had more running plays than and than passing plays, but the the differential was much smaller than every other year that he's been an offensive coordinator in football bowl subdivision. That was the only year that 2017 season, the only year that his team rushed for less than 200 yards per game, and they rushed for 199. So this is a guy that not only I mean yes you got to throw the football, yes he's coming in having great success with guys like McKenzie Milton. Uh, Dylan Gabriel and uh, Matt Corral. But the other thing that he's trying to do is he's trying to create balance and he wants to run the football. And I think that's really going to benefit the Oklahoma Sooners because we saw this past year, they were more than willing to get away from the running game at times. And, and it was to their detriment, even in, in situations where it wasn't working. That's when you still run the ball. You got to protect your quarterback a little bit, protect your, especially your true freshman quarterback a little bit. And you got to run the football even if it doesn't work sometimes. It may not be the most efficient play call, but in college, all it takes is just one hole, one missed assignment by the defense, and your running back's gone. And I think that was one of the the negative aspects of Lincoln Riley's play calling this year is it seemed like he was more than willing to abandon the run a little bit too early in games when he had a good running back in Kennedy Brooks. He had an offensive line that at times was a better run-blocking unit than it was a pass-blocking unit. And so looking at Jeff Levy's offense as it pertains to the Oklahoma Sooners and getting ready for the 2022 season, there's a lot of Sooners that are going to benefit greatly from Jeff Levy's offense. And we're going to talk about it specifically next. Uh, after I talk to you about bet online, bet online would wish you like to wish you a happy new betting year as now we continue our March to the playoffs and beyond the NFL season is going strong. If you haven't gotten in on the action over there, you can get, it done at Bet Online. It remains the number one spot for all the best sports wagering action for 2022. It's a new year and a new updated desktop and mobile website to sign up for today. And you can receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit just using our promo code locked on. That's you put in $100, Bet Online will give you $50 for free just using our promo code 
Locked On. From football, basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2022 season. Bet Online is the fastest and the easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports. That's Bet Online, where the game starts. And so now let's talk about players that I feel like are going to benefit really, really well uh, from Jeff Levy's offense. And first, I'm gonna, I want to talk about the wide receivers. Obviously, Marvin Mims, I think, is going to benefit from a, an offense that's going to be a little bit more uh, methodical. Like, so much of what took away from his ability to win downfield was the fact that the Oklahoma Sooners were just looking to win downfield almost all the time. They weren't necessarily looking to to be methodical and drive the field and, and just kind of um, just poke at defenses, just prod defenses a little bit with the short passing game. If you hit that short passing game enough, eventually the safeties are going to have to creep up. You can't play shell coverage, cover two, cover four, or cover three, and just take away the deep ball. You're going to have to start cheating guys up if if uh, you're going to hit these short area passing um, options. A guy like Marvin Mims, he's going to be good in any aspect of the offense that you give him. Does he is he great on deep balls? Absolutely, but he's a guy that needs to get the ball all over the field. There's no reason that he should have games where he just has three catches or he has four targets in a game. Like this is one of your best players. He's a playmaker with the ball in his hands. You got to give him the you got to give him a chance. And too many times they were just throwing ball yolo balls up in the double and triple coverage. And that doesn't give him a chance. You got to get him the ball at times on slants on in routes, on you know stop routes, things like that, so that you can use double moves and you can get him going downfield on like sluggos where you run that slant and that go, that that uh, stop and go. You want to use those things so that, or you know, you want to use the short area passing game to set up the deep passing game. That's kind of how it works. It works in coordination with one another. And for some reason, Marvin Mims was just a deep threat, and that's all they ever wanted to use him as. And it really it's really unfortunate because he's got so much more to his game than that. The other guy I think really benefits from this a lot is Theo Weiss. Like Theo Weiss is the prototypical like possession receiver. He's a guy that's going to be able to make plays in the short to intermediate part of part of the field. He can catch a ball for five yards, take it for 10 more. He's a guy that's going to be able to, you know, generate a ton of first downs. And that's a lot of what Jeff Levy does generate in his offense is first downs. We talked about it in the first segment, every single season that he's been an offensive coordinator, his team's finished in the top 10 in first downs per game, usually about 25, 26 first downs per game. You get first downs, you're more likely to score. You don't get first downs. You're not going to score too many times. The Oklahoma Sooners couldn't convert on third down. They, they got, they shot themselves in the foot, setting themselves with, with second and third and longs. Uh, this past season because they didn't have a guy that was going to be able to make guys miss um, after the catch in the short to intermediate part of the field. But they also didn't run enough in the short to intermediate part of the field uh, for the Oklahoma Sooners. They, they just tried to get everything, you know, 15, 20 yards downfield, or it was a screen play or it was the, the bootleg rollout to Jeremiah Hall on the flat, which I love that play. It's great in the red zone. But when you're facing like second and long, you gotta you gotta like attack the sticks a little bit, um, and their inability to generate first downs impacted their ability to to score, obviously, but to just create balance in the off or keep balance in the offense. Because if they're they're failing on first down, then they're feeling more and more pressure to throw on second down and third down, and so then you're not using your one of your best assets in Kennedy Brooks or an explosive guy like Eric Gray in the running game because you're you're putting yourself behind the chains and you're having to throw more. So I think I think Theo Weiss is going to benefit from this a lot. You look back to 2020, he tied for the team lead in receptions with Marvin Mims. Now he didn't have as many yards, but he wasn't being utilized in the same way that Marvin Mims was as a deep threat. Theo Weiss is your guy that you want winning in the short to intermediate part of the field. And that's what he's going to give you. And that's how he's going to benefit from you just as that possession receiver. He's going to be Dylan Gabriel's best friend uh, this next year. Obviously, you know, the, the rest of the wide receiver crew is going to benefit greatly. A guy like Jalil Farouk, who he'll do really, really well, because I think he could be a guy that you throw into the slot and he's going to be very successful again, like Theo Weiss in the short short intermediate part of the field. And then you're, and then as he wins in that short area of the field, you're able to push him deep as well. Um, Look at the running game. Like I mentioned it in the first segment, 
Jeff Levy's teams rushed for more than 200 yards per game every single season, except for his 2017 team um, with UCF. They rushed for 199 yards per game. I'm looking at a guy like Marcus Major, and I'm thinking this is going to be your chance to really solidify yourself as an early down back in the Oklahoma Sooners offense, as a guy that could potentially be a lead back for them this year um, as they're kind of getting Gavin Sawchuck and um, Javante Barnes up to speed. I'd really like to see them really dig into Marcus Major and Eric Gray as a tandem and using Marcus Major on, you know, kind of obvious running downs because he just runs hard, runs fast, runs with a bit of an edge, um, and then using Eric Gray as a change of pace or vice versa. Like if you're going to bring Eric Gray in and use him kind of as your dual threat back, your scat back, similar to uh, a Deuce Vaughn, where you're going to give him the ball as, as often as possible in a lot of different situations. And then you bring Marcus Major in as kind of the hammer as the change of pace. That's fine, but got to f- figure out a way to get Marcus Major the football. And I think Jeff Levy's going to. He's going to want to run the football. Again, he ran the ball more um, on average than he did throw with the ball. Uh, you know, most seasons he was running the ball 44 times a game. Like that's huge for, for an offense. And if it's good for your offensive line too. run blocking, you'll hear offensive linemen talk about it all the time. Run blocking is easier than pass blocking. Going forward is much easier than going backwards. And it helps to build your momentum. If you're the one establishing the physicality, setting the tone offensively by run blocking. I think Marcus Major is going to have a big, big season for the Oklahoma Sooners in 2022. He came, you know, back from his academic ineligibility in 2021, and the few carries that he got, he was a dude running with purpose. And I'm excited to see what he's going to do for the Oklahoma Sooners in 2022 because I think that he's going to benefit probably the most out of the running backs that they have. I'm excited about Gavin Sawchuk, and I'm excited about Javante Barnes. But if Oklahoma is kind of like set on trying to redshirt them a little bit or minimize their touches this year, which I'm not saying that they are. These guys could end up getting on the field early. Marcus Major is the guy that I'm looking to give the ball to 15 times a game because I want to see what he's capable of with that kind of a workload because he's a guy that is going to make plays. He's going to make plays after contact, and he's going to generate a lot of first downs for you as well. Um, Obviously, I think the quarterback situation is going to benefit. You know, We know Dylan Gabriel – has a relationship with Jeff Levy in this offense and he had a lot of success under it. So he's going to benefit too. But I think also the defense is going to benefit from an offense that is looking to play ball control football is good. Looking to have these, you know, big uh, from a offense that's looking to run a lot of plays. If you're running 70 plays a game, that takes a lot of pressure off of your defense to have to be on the field more and more. And, Again, for the good things that Lincoln Riley's offense was at times for the Oklahoma Sooners, scoring fast isn't always the best thing. And you can you can tire your defense out pretty quickly that way. Um, so keeping your offense on the field, letting your defense be fresh when they get back on the field, I think that's going to be huge for them. So indirectly, I think the defense is going to benefit uh, from Jeff Levy's presence as well. And I, again, I think a guy like Braden Willis coming back um, you now, He's going to have some competition for snaps from Daniel Parker Jr. Uh, if they get Michael Trigg from USC, that, that'll provide some competition. And then you got Jason Llewellyn and Caden Helms coming in in the 2022 recruiting class as well that could end up you know, vying for some snaps uh, early on if possible. But if not, then I think Braden Willis has a chance to have a, a really, really nice season for the Oklahoma Sooners. I think he could end up being a guy that catches like 40 passes, has you know, 400, 500 yards, receiving six touchdowns, something like that. And maybe even more, maybe he's a guy that approaches 50, 60 catches if they use him in the offense, like I think they should and get him the ball because he is a capable receiver and he's a guy that can make some things happen after the catch too, because he's a physical player and you, you listen to him talk and he's a guy that wants to run block. He wants to be physical. He wants to get nasty. And I think that's going to be the MO for the Oklahoma Sooners this year. And, and I think he's going to fit perfectly into Levy's scheme when obviously they want to run the football. They want to get on teams and they want to pound away. And they're going to run a lot of plays doing it. And then when they do need to pass, I think Braden Willis is going to be a great option for that as well. Coming up next, let's talk through some basketball notes. Had a up and down weekend for the Oklahoma Sooners basketball teams. Uh, the men, not so great. And the women, pretty great. So we'll talk about it. 
coming up next on the Locked On Sooners podcast. But first, let me talk to you about Built Bar. Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar. It's the new year, so that means New Year's resolutions. If yours is about getting fitter, eating healthier, make sure you include Built Bar in your plan. I know for me, I'm trying to eat a little bit healthier, minimize like the, the sweet treats that I eat, uh, minimize some of the, like, the fast food that I'm eating as well. And so when I go to look for a snack, I'm going to grab a Built Bar. It, it, first, it was something that I just kind of did, and I, but I love it. Like Built Bar is a great snack for me. It, it provides the, the sweet treat that I'm looking for, but it also provides good proteins. It has A lot of times they have 15 to 18 grams of protein and just 130 to 180 calories. Um, four or five grams of sugar and net carbs. So it's a really, really well-balanced protein bar that gives you a lot of good nutrients and vitamins as well. And you can go to built.com. You can use promo code LOCKS15 to get 15% off your next order at built.com. Go try the peanut butter brownie. That's by far my favorite, but so many great options and flavors for you. If you if you like things that are fruity flavored, they've got plenty of options for you there as well. Uh, but go to built.com, use promo code LOCKS15 to get 15% off your next order at built.com. Um, let's talk Oklahoma Sooners basketball. So let's start off on a high note and talk about the women's side. Uh, the women, you know, they bounced back from a loss to Iowa State. Now they've won three in a row over Kansas, uh, number 14, Baylor and TCU. Uh, but it's really the Baylor and the TCU games against Baylor is their first win over them since I think 2015 or 16. Uh, Baylor was number 14 in the country, and they beat them 83-77 earlier in the week. And then they came back on Saturday and just demolished TCU 100-71. And the Oklahoma Sooners, who have the number two scoring offense in the nation on the women's side, they're continuing to just put up tons and tons of points. And Skylar Van was named the Big 12 Player of the Week uh, for her efforts off the bench this week. Uh, she had a great game against Baylor, scoring um, – or sorry, over the week, she averaged 21 points, uh, six and a half rebounds and two assists and two steals in both of Oklahoma's wins against Baylor. Uh, she was eight of 13 from the field, including three to seven on three pointers, uh, helping the Oklahoma Sooners win that game. And, you know, in total, she saw 53.6% from the field and 41.7% on three point tries um, and was seven to seven from the free throw line. So just a huge couple of wins for the Oklahoma Sooners women's basketball team. And they're, you know, they're in second place right now in the big 12. They're 14 and two on the season and are really looking good. Like they're playing really good basketball. They're scoring a ton of points and they've got threats up and down the lineup. So it's going to be a lot of fun to watch them this year. The Jenny uh, Baranchik uh, era of basketball is really starting off strong. Uh, so shout out to her and congrats to her and the ladies for a couple big wins. Uh, this past week and to Skylar Van for Big 12 Player of the Week. And then on the men's side, things are not going as well. Um, they had a big uh, win over Iowa State a week and a half ago, uh, 79-66. Iowa State was ranked number 11 at the time. And then they followed that up with a 14-point loss to Texas and then lost in overtime to TCU. And it's, you know, against Texas, it just was never really, like they were never really in it. It was a game that Texas just kind of controlled throughout pretty much the whole game. And then against TCU, they had a lead late in the second half and then just kind of let it slip away. And then TCU was able to generate a pretty big lead uh, with just a couple few minutes left to play in that game. Oklahoma was able to storm back to tie it up to go to overtime. And, you know, Oklahoma had their chances in at the end of overtime to win the game. Uh, they couldn't get a stop against TCU who, you know, took the, got the game, the go ahead shot with just under, I don't know, 30 seconds to play or so. And then, um, or maybe fewer, maybe it was like less than 20 seconds per game or 20 seconds left in the game. Uh, and then they get a shot and, you know, it's Elijah Harkless who I love. I love as a player is a guy that you have to have on your team because he plays great defense and he can hit some clutch shots for you, but he just didn't take a great shot at the end of the overtime game. Just, it was contested. He was kind of falling away, falling into it. Never really got a good look at it. Um, and the kind of the disappointing thing there is that they weren't able to get anybody an open look. And credit to TCU's defense. They played really, really well. TCU played hard that game. They, they crashed the boards, forced Oklahoma into a ton of turnovers. And if there's a flaw right now in Porter Moser's squad, it's that they do turn the ball over way too much. They had um, close to 20 turnovers in this game. And that's not, you're not going to be able to win a lot of basketball games that way, you know, and 
and it wasn't like um, TCU didn't give them the opportunity to win it. TCU had 19 turnovers. Oklahoma had 20. But, you know, that one turnover is the game. Like, it's it, it could be the, the very essence of the basketball game. You know, Oklahoma led 29-27 at half. TCU outscored them 23-21 in the first in the second half. It's like it's one possession. That one possession matters. And you turn the ball over 20 times and you have more turnovers than your opponent, it's a great chance you're going to lose the game. And that's something they're going to have to figure out as they go into, you know, the the heart of the Big 12 schedule. They got a, a huge game against Kansas coming up on Tuesday night, uh, and it doesn't get any easier from there. I mean, the, the Oklahoma Sooners schedule is – it's going to be a murderer's row for them. They got Kansas, number seven, Kansas, followed by number five, Baylor. They got West Virginia after that, and then they go to n- number two, Auburn, after that. So, you know, they're going to have to figure out their their um, their ball handling situation. Who's going to take care of the basketball for them? Who's going to make the smart play? Who's going to make the right play? Uh, I'm impressed with some of the things I'm seeing out of Bajan Cortez. For a freshman, he's playing well beyond his years. Tanner Groves provides a lot of energy off the bench. And Moji Gibson, he's just up and down. He can be great one game and then kind of underwhelming the next game. They've got to find some secondary scoring uh, and they got to find some balance. They got to find a guy that they can rely on every single game to provide that scoring touch for him because it's just been, you know, Elijah Harkless here, Emoji Gibson here, Tanner Groves here. Uh, sometimes we're getting a Jordan Goldwire hitting some shots and, and leading the team in scoring. And so they've got to figure out who's going to be their guy. And they just haven't figured that out yet. Uh, But there's a lot of time between now and March for them to establish themselves as a tournament team there. If they're able to knock off some of these ranked opponents coming up in the next few weeks, it's going to definitely help their resume and help them get into the tournament. If they're able to get through big 12 play and, and into the big 12 tournament and, you know, win a couple games, I think it'll put them in a really good position to make some noise in March Madness because they'll be a very well battle tested team. They'll have gone through some really tough opponents to get to where they're at at the end of the season. So not all is lost. It was a rough week for them, but they're going to have a chance to bounce back. And depending on how they perform against Kansas, it could really um, help determine what their season is going to look like the rest of the way but that's going to do it for today's episode of locked on sooners thank you so much for tuning in and uh, following the show wherever you get your podcasts also free and available on youtube so make sure you check it out over there subscribe to the show hit the notification bell to let you know when a new episode drops and let me know how you feel about the show in the in the, uh, in the comment section let me know how you feel about jeff levy's offense who do you think is going to benefit the most uh, from oklahoma's new offensive coordinator How do you feel like the basketball teams are going to do? What do you think the ceiling is for them moving forward? We'll talk to you tomorrow on the next episode of Locked On Sooners. My name is John Williams. Boomer Sooner.